Evidence-based medicine is the care of patients using the best available research evidence to guide clinical decision-making. This definition of evidence-based medicine may seem axiomatic, but implementing evidence-based medicine in practice is difficult due to a number of factors. For example, the volume of evidence available, which continues to grow at a rapid pace, makes it very hard for clinicians to keep up. And the volume of research is compounded by the fact that many published study results are false or make misleading conclusions based on the data gathered or the methods employed. The upshot is that many clinicians do not practice medicine according to the best current research evidence. In this lecture, we will review the basic elements of evidence-based medicine. The steps of evidence-based medicine are as follows. 1. Formulate a clinical question. 2. Find the best available evidence. 3. Assess the validity of the evidence, including the internal validity and external validity of that evidence. And 4. Applying the evidence in practice, in conjunction with clinical expertise and patient preferences. By following these steps, healthcare professionals should be in a position to apply the results of research involving patients and clinical outcomes, such as death, disease, symptoms and loss of function in the clinical setting. It is important to note that other kinds of evidence, such as that obtained by personal experience and laboratory studies of the pathogenesis of disease, are also useful in the care of patients, but are not usually included under the header of evidence-based medicine. In the following sections, we will go through each of the steps of evidence-based medicine individually. We will begin with formulating a clinical question. Clinical questions are frequently complex, but we can sharpen the focus by answering more simple questions. For instance, is the finding abnormal? What is the diagnosis? How often does it occur? What are the risk factors for the disease? What is the pathogenesis of the disease? What is the natural history? How effective or harmful is the treatment? And how effective or harmful are preventative interventions? In any case, the question must be explicitly defined before searching for the answer. For example, the question, what is the best treatment for type 2 diabetes is too general and broad to be answered well. For evaluating the effectiveness of an intervention, four questions should be considered. These can be remembered using the commonly used acronym PICO. What is the relevant patient population? What intervention is being considered? What is the comparison intervention or patient population? And what outcomes are of interest? Taking the example from before, a more explicit question that lends itself to the evidence-based medicine process might be, among obese adults with type 2 diabetes, is metformin more effective than sulfonuria drugs in preventing death? Importantly, in this revised version of the question, we have explicitly defined the patient population, the interventions to be compared, and the outcome of interest. By formulating our clinical question correctly, when we go to find, assess, and apply the evidence, we will be using research that was conducted in a similar target population to that of our patient, that adequately described the interventions administered, in the case of a drug therapy, that might involve the dose, timing, and duration of treatment, that used clinically appropriate comparison groups, like a placebo group or usual care, and that considered relevant patient endpoints, including benefits and harms. In practice, though, it is not always possible to find research that meets these explicit criteria. High quality research of very specific groups of patients who are administered narrowly defined treatment schedules and measured using well-defined, valid, reliable outcomes that are sensitive to change are often unavailable. Particular issues related to the types of outcomes measured in clinical studies include the use of composite endpoints. For example, in this study comparing coronary bypass surgery with percutaneous angioplasty and stenting for severe coronary artery disease, the main study outcome was a composite of death, stroke, myocardial infarction, or the need for repeat revascularization. Compared with bypass surgery, percutaneous intervention had a significantly lower risk of stroke, but a significantly higher risk of repeat revascularization. The use of a combined endpoint under these circumstances doesn't make much sense. Another issue in clinical studies is the use of soft outcomes. In contrast to hard outcomes like death and disease, 
soft outcomes that measure function, pain and quality of life are less common but for many questions are the key outcomes of interest. The difficulty lies in the need for subjective interpretation of the instrument or measurement tool by patients or clinicians, and this necessitates a careful development and validation process. Subjective outcomes are usually more susceptible to the placebo effect or expectation bias and strategies to mitigate these errors, such as proper blinding, become critically important. That said, even the hard, objective outcomes can be prone to bias. A final issue that needs to be acknowledged is the use of surrogate outcomes. Surrogate outcomes are considered to predict clinical benefit or harm based on the epidemiologic, pathophysiologic or other scientific evidence. For example, blood pressure might be used as a surrogate measure for a positive clinical outcome following the administration of antihypertensives and hemoglobin A1c medications among diabetes populations. The advantages of using surrogate outcomes rather than clinical outcomes is that studies can generally be done with fewer subjects and completed more quickly at a lower cost. However, the use of surrogate endpoints can lead to erroneous conclusions, and it is for this reason that the 2010 Institute of Medicine recommendations state that surrogate endpoints should only be used if their ability to predict clinically important outcomes is conclusively documented. Now we will move on to the second step of evidence-based medicine, finding the evidence. Most medical information is now rapidly accessible from computers and handheld devices. Despite this, a certain amount of skills required to quickly find the desired information while limiting irrelevant noise. Keeping current with the developments in one's field is challenging and is generally not feasible without the use of a curated resource. Answering all important clinical questions by reading, appraising and summarising evidence would overwhelm the individual clinician. Therefore, the bulk of these tasks must be delegated to trustworthy, tertiary information sources. These have been discussed in greater detail in the lecture entitled Information Needs in Healthcare and Point of Care Decision Support. For the purposes of this lecture, the qualities of useful tertiary information sources for clinicians include portability, ease of use, and an ability to quickly access the relevant information within minutes so that it can guide clinical decisions as they arise. The information should be targeted to the specific clinical question and it should be evidence-based. In the decision support lecture, a rubric was outlined to help the clinician assess the extent to which the information was evidence-based and the different categories of evidence. Next, we will move on to the third step of evidence-based medicine, assessing the validity of the evidence. Clinicians should have the necessary skills to critically evaluate research articles that are important to their practice. A number of guidelines are available that describe standards for conducting and reporting different types of studies, and clinicians can use these as a way to critically evaluate the research. The guidelines endorsed by the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors can facilitate the critical appraisal of individual studies based on the type of study. Systematic reviews and meta-analyses can be evaluated using the preferred reporting items for systematic review and meta-analysis protocols, or PRISMA statement. Randomized control trials can be evaluated using the consolidated standards of reporting trials and the standard protocol items recommendations for interventional trials network. For observational studies, the strengthening the reporting of observational studies in epidemiology or strobe guidelines can be used. And then for diagnostic and prognostic studies, the standards for a reporting of diagnostic accuracy and the transparent reporting of a multivariable prediction model for individual prognosis or diagnosis frameworks can be used. The focus of critical appraisal is on both the internal validity and generalizability or external validity of the research. Internal validity is a measure of whether the results of clinical research are correct for the patients studied. Threats to internal validity include bias and chance. Bias is any systematic error that can produce a misleading impression of the true effect. Randomized trials are performed with the aim of reducing bias and well-conducted trials usually have a low risk of bias. However, flaws in the conduct of clinical trials can produce biased results. Chance is random error, inherent in all observations. The probability of chance producing erroneous results can be minimized by studying a large number of patients. External validity refers to the question of whether the results of the study apply to the patients outside of the study 
Specifically, study patients are typically highly selected, unlike patients in usual practice. Often, they have been referred to academic medical centres, meet stringent inclusion criteria, are free of potentially confounding conditions or disorders, and are willing to countenance the rigorous demands of study protocols. As a result, they may be systematically different from the patients most doctors see in practice. Please note that the internal validity and generalizability of research are complex topics and have only briefly been discussed here. Next, we will move on to the final element in the process of evidence-based medicine, applying the evidence in practice. As I've noted before, there is often a gap between recommendations from the best available evidence and actual practice. We've discussed some of the reasons predicating this, including uncertainty whether results of large studies apply to individual patients, lack of awareness or misunderstanding of the evidence, and failure to organise care in a way that fosters the use of that evidence. However, evidence-based medicine is not intended to replace clinical judgement. Individual patients should be cared for in light of the best available research evidence but with care tailored to their individual circumstances, including their genetic makeup, past and concurrent illnesses, health-related behaviours and personal preferences. Several studies clearly demonstrate that many clinical decisions are not made based on the best research evidence or on relevant individual patient characteristics, but rather reflect the practice habits or practice style of the clinician. A substantial body of research has demonstrated that healthcare professionals engage in systematic errors of omission or commission relative to the best available research evidence. Prominent examples are the widespread prescription of antibiotics for acute cough or the use of radiologic tests for uncomplicated acute low back pain. In some cases, failure to practice according to the best current evidence is due to a knowledge deficit, but, and this is vital, knowledge alone rarely changes behaviour. Behaviour change usually requires a combination of interventions and influences, a number of possible influences on clinicians' behaviour are summarised on screen, and these are based on a growing body of research literature. They can be broken down into education, changing the work environment, feedback and performance, clinical practice guidelines, local opinion leaders, persuasion, economic incentives, and changing patients' perceptions or expectations. And that concludes this lecture outlining the steps of evidence-based medicine. In this lecture, we gave a background of the four key questions underlying the evidence-based medicine process. We then delved into each of these questions and summarised some of the barriers to evidence-based medicine. This lecture was prepared for students enrolled in the UCD School of Public Health, Physiotherapy and Sports Science. 